This, confer this conference will now be recorded. All right, so this particular session is going to be recorded. And obviously, uh, for those of you who are not able to attend, uh, would be able to get a copy of this recording just after the session from the end. So um, what we're going to do is obviously continue our journey with regards to um, you know completing a learning outcome two today. And in this particular learning outcome, we are looking at discussing uh, how to understand, um, basically looking at understanding how to build and lead a multidisciplinary team or MDT for the purposes of looking at integrated service delivery. So from our point of view, um, what we're going to be looking at, um, you know, in this particular learning outcome is going to go and talk about uh, a couple of things. Uh, we look at some of the uh, bits which have been given in the, um, you know, the uh, the indicative content. So let me just quickly bring that up. And what I want to do is obviously um, share that indicative content just to make sure that you're aware that this is, um, you know, how we are going to be looking at um, covering this particular content. So just getting a quick grip uh, with, uh, you know, looking at sharing that part of the screen. So give me a second. And what I want to do is uh, make sure that you're able to, uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, understand that the learning outcome too is more about, uh, you know, building and leading an MDT or a multidisciplinary team. And this would essentially be, um, you know, um, let's say important because it's mostly theoretical. And what we want to do is understand and build on our understanding for, uh, you know, the a team working model that we did discuss in the first learning outcome, which is uh, Tuckman's model of team building. Now, in this context, what we want to do is essentially just quickly go ahead and uh, you know discuss what is in the indicative content. So we are looking at understanding strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, of um, multidisciplinary teams. You know, a range of things which we want to understand. I think the key terminology that we will be looking at would be what is integrated service delivery, and I have a small video. Uh, that I would would watch, uh, you know, share with you so that we'll all watch it together to understand this particular meaning of the term integrated service delivery because the whole idea of actually leading, let's say, whole idea of actually managing, putting together, managing, and then leading this multidisciplinary team is to look at providing integrated uh, service delivery in the health and social care sector. So we look at some advantages, disadvantages, or strengths and weaknesses in terms of what are the main reasons why MDTs are formed, what could be the positives of it or advantages, and what could be some of the negatives or disadvantages of it when people work together in MDTs in order to be able to look at delivering integrated service. Um, we'll focus on the second assessment criteria, which is going to be uh, you know, morely, uh, more or less solely based on understanding team building, leading, and motivating. And this is where we'll be looking at the Dr. Belvin's uh, more team building role model, uh, which is the theoretical framework that we need to understand to cover some of the bits in terms of understanding what uh, roles could be assigned, uh, why people are suitable for certain kind of roles within uh, the teams, uh, you know, and then what uh, could be the skills experience or attributes that bring to that role and why they are classed in that particular category. So we look at some of the research with Dr. Belvin did, and then he proposed this Dr. Belvin's um, team roles model is what we're going to study for the assessment criteria 2.2. And then the last one, what we're going to be looking at is understanding how do we lead uh, MDTs uh, in terms of delivering integrated service, uh, you know, in terms of patient care, uh, when we talk about patient care uh, or patient-centered care, uh, or approach PCA as we call it. And that is what we will do in terms of understanding in the last assessment criteria, which is 2.3. So starting nicely with understanding why MDTs are put together, how they are put together, theoretical part of it, and then looking at how do we lead the MDTs should you be in that position um, you know, of, of interest. Now, looking at the first learning outcome, we did discuss some key terms, which obviously are going to be consistently discussed across this particular unit and this is basically looking at why do we need multidisciplinary teams and what are multidisciplinary teams we also looked at some of the key roles which are in the health and social care sector and i've kind of used 
uh, you know, a, a picture graphic essentially to describe all the various kind of roles that we get to see within this sector. Now, some of the key messages that we would be looking at and obviously going through in this particular unit are focused on the fact that, uh, you know, MDTs are pretty much a part and parcel of the uh, you know, National Health Service or the health and social care sector uh, as against any other sector that we get to see and work in. The MDTs primarily are an effective tool because in some cases when the goal uh, to be achieved is greater uh, in terms of you know the objectives and a lot of people are required to work on them then obviously collaboration uh, you know tends to be the name of the game and in this case what we do get to see is that uh, leaders supervisors managers at some stage start uh, looking at forming teams uh, which are going to be like-minded professionals who would essentially come with some knowledge background experience and skills to be able to deliver integrated care to patients uh, so that the, there are uh, manageable outcomes which which come out of that particular uh, delivery we also look at uh, you know that sometimes when you look at putting the mdds together they require a bit of coordination and there could be barriers, there could be effective ways of managing these teams and communication tends to be one of them. Uh, and you would generally see that in large teams, there are people which are given specific roles of, uh, you know, uh, in order to carry out those, uh, um, you know, functions. A simple example of this, what I would give is that if you are having a team meeting, there is somebody who normally would be a notes taker and, uh, you know, there will be a manager chair in the meeting and they'll be participant in the meeting similarly of this uh, you know concept if we extrapolate that and apply this to the health and social care sector what we're going to see is that the mdts work wherein roles are specifically given to specific individuals and they are uh, you know uh, quite competent in carrying out those roles so we will look at that um, you know by looking into the theoretical model of dr meredith belvin and its team roles and then we look at this approach, why this has become very synonymous with the approach in the National Health Service and in the health and social care sector. And we will be looking at, um, you know, I'll be probably looking at giving you a steer in the direction of reading one or two articles, which pro primarily would give you some detailed idea in terms of why MDTs are important and why the integrated, uh, why, why MDTs are important for the delivery of integrated delivery in terms of service, uh, patient care, for example. Uh, uh, specifically in the case of health and social care sector. Now, let's look at uh, a video which, which I would want to start up with, which is to understand and give you a broader understanding of, you know, what is integrated delivery. And this is what I would, uh, you know, essentially want to start up with. So let me just uh, share a different part of the screen so that we are able to see this particular video and then listen in. Uh, to understand this. So let's look at this video, which is uh, primarily courtesy SCIE, and uh, it explains the concept of integrated care uh, and service delivery and why is it important within the health and social care sector using multi multidisciplinary teams. With consultants dealing with a very specific set of diseases like diabetes or dementia or heart trouble, uh, and people have been treated as if they've only got that one disease. However, now the majority of people here over the age of 75 have at least three of those long term conditions, which means they need to be treated as a whole person rather than a series of individuals. So, the series of individual diseases. So what that means is that we're asking lots of people who are used to operating and working independently, now working together in an integrated form. And that's what today's about. So the, the good practice is that we have a, a common sense of um, what we need to do together. Um, so we are looking, we're not fully integrated, but we're aligning what we're doing. Um, we're creating multidisciplinary approaches, particularly looking at health and social care staff. So bringing together um, community health services, mental health and social care staff to work and then to take a place-based approach to how we deliver care. So that's, that's one of the good things that we'd say. On the issue of culture with our health and social care services, I mean, one way we tried to tackle it right at the beginning was um, we had quite a big workshop where we invited people across health and social care 
and we talked about the importance of what we're trying to do to try and get that shared vision you know so that we've all bought into the same um, yeah vision for what, what we're trying to achieve and, and the difference we're trying to make and the way we did that was to uh, look at some key statements and what people thought about those key statements and whether they agreed or they didn't and we found that there was quite a lot of commonality in that vision for uh, trying to get people discharged as quickly as possible because there are real benefits for people in terms of their recovery and their longer term health and well-being um, so that brought people together but also within that workshop what we did was we had people sit at tables for their own organisations so we had the acute trust social care entre sector community health each sitting at their own table and people circulated around them and heard about what their priorities were around what we're looking to do to integrate health and social care to try and work on these issues and that enabled people to really hear what are the issues for you for your organization um, and how are they different to my issues for my organization and we got that to try and get this shared understanding of the cultural differences um, and that combined with we'd also done a program where we were trying to develop anyway integration change champions and part of that was again we did some workshops around exploring cultural differences across organizations and what often came up were actually some of those differences are more about perception rather than reality and actually at the, the bed bones of stuff there are a huge numbers of similarities across all our organizations and sometimes it's just around the processes being different um, and, and that's something i can work with a lot more so as you can see that um you know uh, what we have come across is the concept of integrated care and i think in the start of the video the gentleman here actually described it quite effectively saying that why you know the approach of multidisciplinary teams is important in the delivery of integrated care to patients within the nhs and in the wider community in general so what we want to be able to do essentially is uh, you know look at some of the uh, bits which have been mentioned and then basically look at applying this to this particular uh, you know learning uh, outcome in, in general throughout and I think the first assessment criteria that we're going to be looking at uh, which discusses this is going to be uh, focused on understanding the strengths and weaknesses of MDTs and what is their role essentially in the uh, you know delivery of integrated care so the role of MDTs is what is being highlighted in this video and um, <clears throat> uh, what what I'm going to do is um, you know uh, essentially now discuss what are the strengths and weaknesses so advantages and disadvantages of mdts uh, which is which are uh, you know important in the delivery of integrated care so one of the first things that comes up is that you know when we work and we apply this particular approach of mdt it allows patients to access the entire team of experts you know when they are looking at getting uh, care or obviously you know getting uh, to some sort of diagnosis um, or wanting to go into the diagnosis in terms of receiving the care i think what becomes important at some stage is that they get the access to the entire uh, team of, of experts so things like when you when you are in a hospital and obviously uh, wanting to undergo uh, a surgery or say you need care then you have the access to the entire team you have access to consultants you have doctors uh, you have practice managers or practice nurses essentially like clinical nurses you have healthcare professionals and you know other professionals within that remit who are then able to provide you the best possible treatment that is currently available to solve or rectify the condition that you uh, that you have it could be an example taking uh, people receiving you know uh, care in covid the people receiving uh, care especially for cancer treatments or other kind of you know um, let's say uh, um, you know serious diseases like uh, this consultant mentioned diabetes and heart uh, conditions and in those cases you need to be really looking at getting access to the entire team of experts 
before undergoing any operative procedure. The second advantage tends to be, or strength of the MDT tends to be in terms of service coordination. So what we do get to see is when people are working together in multidisciplinary teams, uh, trying to provide integrated care, the commitment levels, uh, you know, and the level of commitments that is seen uh, is generally, you know, leading to greater efficiencies and obviously coordinated approach. And in this case, you know, this framework of uniformity allows the patient to receive, uh, you know, treatment to the standards which have been defined. And this allows also a speedy recovery to happen in some cases after the patient has received palliative care, uh, say, for example, um, you know, undergoing some sort of a procedure or, uh, you know, essentially, um, uh, you know, receiving some sort of um, a procedure. So when we talk about this particular approach, uh, you know, it looks at providing improved coordination uh, because of the accessibility of the team working to deliver this service to a particular patient. Now, sometimes you also see that one of the advantages tends to be or strength tends to be that it expertise referral process. So when we see, you know, this, if you look at imagining that, uh, you know, if the GP surgeries were working differently or not connected with uh, some sort of a central medical database or records that we have in the National Health Service, it would have been very difficult for somebody to see, you know, as a GP, I would see a patient at the surgery and then if I had to refer the patient for further investigations to the hospital or to any, it would have been very difficult to, tran you know, translocate all the records and, you know, uh, observations and have that being sent over. So, when we look at this process of referral, which tends to happen wherein if this is something that cannot be done, then in some cases, if you have to refer patients across to specific areas or people within the practice or within the larger community, which is the NHS, you would generally see that for specific treatment, referral as a process works best because there is a seamless integration of uh, the departments working together to be able to you know, uh, provide at this particular service without uh, you know exercising any delays or uh, delays in the treatment of the patient so the referral process seems to be seamless if you are diagnosed with a particular problem the gp would straight away refer to your hospital obviously you'll have a consultation uh, there will be uh, steps put in place to ensure that uh, you are able to get the service promptly and obviously you know uh, uh, you have the maximum chances of you your health being restored to, uh, or you know, you imp your health improving to the standards which is required, and you, you know, if if it was a disease or a condition that was diagnosed, then you are rid of that condition or that uh, you know diagnosed with, with the proper and timely diagnosis because the referral process is seamless. Then we also look at the avenues for uh, you know service implementation, which is basically saying that uh, you know, because of the MDT approach, patients are able to access multiple resources and people within different departments and organization. And this allows uh, you know, the resources to be effectively put together to use, uh, to be able to bring out or you know, provide care for the patients. And at the same time, what we also do get to see is that uh, you know, this approach allows um, you know, patients to be able to access those resources to be able to receive immediate care. One second, let me just uh, do one quick search. So let me just have a quick uh, two. Yeah, and then the other bit which I was trying to, I was trying to get one or two learners online. So the other bit that we also see as an advantage is that it allows patients to create goals for themselves. That That is what, uh, what I mean by that is that uh, in some cases, uh, you know, you would see that uh, in um, in some cases, um, you know, the patients would be able to set, um, you know, specific goals. And this is where I would kind of, you know, bring in the example of, um, I would say, um, you know, say, for example, if you've gone undergone some sort of care and you've had a bit of a, uh, you know, say, for example, uh, you know, an operative procedure, uh, done then in those cases what tends to be uh, the case is that in order for you to recover fully what will happen is that at some stage you would need different uh, you know people to be able to support you uh, in order for you to you know get back to your uh, say normal self and in those cases you would generally see that uh, when we talk about palliative care we talk about physical emotional and practical support which is provided to people with terminal illness and in those cases you generally see that 
if you have to set goals, um, you know, specifically in the case of improvement goals or uh, goals that the patients need to be able to hit on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, uh, they would, uh, you know, be very well coordinated and designed to be able to make uh, them effective under the approach of the MDTs. A simple example that I would give here is that we see obesity as a as a large problem within large, uh, you know, most developing and developed countries. And we do get to see that if people are to lose weight uh, or, you know, lose weight and have a controlled diet in terms of uh, nutritious diet, but at the same time lose weight, they need to be able to create, uh, you know, uh, so when, for example, uh, you're referred to by your GP uh, to a wellness clinic or to a clinic wherein you would be undergoing, uh, you know, um, let's say not treatment, but undergoing specific, uh, let's say, you would be receiving, um, you know, a specific advice to be able to reduce weight, how to lose weight. Then in those cases, you know, you would, uh, the patients would be required to create specific goals which they can uh, work on on a daily, weekly basis and achieve those goals to be able to reduce the overall, uh, you know, obesity or the, or lose weight essentially. So there, in those such cases, you would see that the multidisciplinary team approach tries to encourage, uh, you know, the wider members of the community, family in particular, for participation, and this allows the patient, uh, you know, essentially to uh, to hit those goals. And that is where you would generally get to see this. Um, uh, you know, being done on a on a on a, on an advantage or as a as a basis wherein it is considered as one of the strengths of the MDT. Now, when we talk about some of the strengths and advantages, we should also be looking at some of the disadvantages of the MDT approach. Now, sometimes you get to see that some of these disadvantages could be that um, you know the MDT approach uh, tends to create a bit of pressure or a stress. I would say time pressure essentially in in some cases when when we look at a lot of goals and objectives which have to be met uh, in order to deliver integrated care so sometimes you will see that there are modifications required in the treatment plan and these uh, modifications create uh, or you know changes which are done essentially create stress and pressure time pressure uh, with the staff which is involved in delivering you know this integrated care so a simple example of this could be that uh, sometimes you look at this working uh, hand in hand uh, with a bit of a collaborative approach, but also you get to see this that it creates a bit of a pressure on the team because if you have a number of patients uh, which are waiting to receive this treatment and a case in point that I would give you as an example would be that during COVID uh, pandemic, what we've seen is that a lot of other, uh, you know, illnesses, patient with other uh, you know, illnesses have got left out things and there's a backlog which has got created. So what has happened is, although the entire team was focused, uh, you know, and the whole NHS was focused on dealing with the pandemic, but this may, has meant that modifications to the um, treatment plan or, you know, modifications in the sense, postponing of treatments for other patients, which are termed as non-critical illnesses uh, were uh, because of the shortage of, you know, ICU beds or ventilators and things like that was done. And that has created a bit of a backlog and in general, a time pressure in terms of providing these services at the NHS. And this is, uh, you know, considered as a, as a disadvantage or as a weakness of uh, multidisciplinary team because the whole approach was focused on dealing with the pandemic and uh, that is where some of the other uh, you know patients have got left out uh, because of the postponement of uh, you know operations and uh, you know procedures which were supposed to be carried out the second disadvantage we do get to see is that different team members come from unique backgrounds so sometimes cultural differences communication can lead to communication uh, you know issues can uh, also mean that people coming from different backgrounds and different skill sets and different, uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, domains from when they are put together into a team. And some of them would, uh, you know, be looking at, uh, obviously, um, you know, not working well within those teams because they, they feel that they might have more experience or have had more experience because of their knowledge, skill set, and the academic background. And in some cases, what you generally get to see that it, creates, uh, you know, maybe a, a bit of a reverse, uh, you know, um, um, it reverses the, uh, you know, main aspect of putting multidisciplinary teams together. So here you would see 
people with different backgrounds from different cultures coming together with different you know number of years of experience and they would feel that some of them have not been dealt the right hand in terms of being put together into very commissioner or uh, you know beginners team and have not been given additional responsibility and because of which you would generally see challenges can arrive in terms of working the other uh, you know weakness or disadvantage tends to be that you require frequent collaboration and the collaboration needs to be effective in order for it to be uh, able to work to provide integrated care so sometimes you would see that you know if there is a large team and a lot of people are working towards a particular achieving a particular goal you, you would normally see if communication is not done as and used as an effective medium to send information across uh, it sometimes does happen that not everybody is singing from the same uh, hymn book and in those cases uh, it could have detrimental effects uh, in terms of the integrated care which the team is responsible for providing and you generally get to see uh, this happening you know primarily in places wherein sometimes we see in the news that you know the the trusts are being investigated because of so many number of deaths or so many uh, cases which have arisen uh, and that is primarily because of negligence or large teams not being able to collaborate uh, and that would mean that sometimes a lot of time is wasted and spent on you know meetings and uh, and and it does not lead to some sort of uh, conclusion or meaningful conclusion we also look at uh, resources sometimes when there are lots of people within the teams resources can be constrained can become a constraint and this this tends to have an effect on the uh, you know the delivery of integrated care which the team is responsible for delivering so nhs we do get to hear that you know nhs is cash trap nhs has a lot of pressure on resources and sometimes having large teams or complex teams which basically are involved in the delivery of integrated care uh, specifically within the pccts trusts and things like that you would generally see that you know uh, availability of resources tends to become a weakness uh, when you have large teams and they compete for the same set of resources to be able to you know deliver on the goals and then you look at indecisions or incomplete decisions which happen without complete information that means sometimes you would see that uh, decisions are difficult to be uh, you know they are difficult uh, in terms of reaching uh, because the team has different opinions the, the members in the team have different opinions background experience and they come across and obviously put some of these points across quite strongly which means consensus cannot be built in some cases and decision making uh, can can be delayed and in those cases obviously it has a retrospective effect on the integrated care or the care which is required to be provided to the patient so sometimes you would see uh, uh, decisions are taken with incomplete information decisions can be delayed or decisions taken uh, do not have or the members taking the decisions do not have access to the full information and in those cases you know the in the decision taken sometimes can be detrimental uh, from a point of view of providing care. Now, as a end result of understanding the strengths and weaknesses or advantages and disadvantages of MDT, what I would suggest is uh, as a bit of an introspective, if you think about uh, your own place of work and see what does the, what does the term integrated service delivery mean uh, to your organization, and then pick out an example and discuss that for the completion of task 2.1 and i think that would give you a sense of perspective and also uh, you know help uh, you understand uh, the the meaning of integrated service delivery and integrated care and what it means at your place of work with regards to your role and responsibility that you have within the organization that you work now going across to the second assessment criteria is quite key. this particular criteria is uh, you know very closely linked with uh, you know task 1.2 where it talked about analyzing skills and techniques required to build cross function uh, multi uh, you know cross disciplinary teams or multidisciplinary teams now in this particular task we are looking at discussing analysis uh, basically looking at doing an analysis of the skills which are required to build motivate and lead multidisciplinary teams so essentially the focus is primarily on uh, understanding skills required uh, to build uh, um, mdt now what i would suggest is if you go through this particular article which is uploaded on moodle and this particular article um, which i will show you in a second talks about um, you know essentially discussing um, let's say um, um, you know what, what are the key factors which make 
the MDD is successful. So let me just quickly uh, show you for a second in terms of you know what article uh, that I'm referring to. And uh, as you will see that uh, this is something that you'll recognize that we used it in the first learning outcome. And this particular article, you know, talks about multidisciplinary teams and, and then what are the skills required and what are the factors required which are essential for the team uh, MDT to be successful. And if you study each of these factors, you know, when we talk about the skills required to build a team, that means if you are putting together an MDT to work and take over, uh, you know, take on a particular objective, what we need to be very clear about is that people working within the health and social care sector or within the national health service, mental health care service, would need to know very clearly things like what is patient-centered care, what what do we mean by physician integration? That means doctors and GPs and consultants. Why do we need to have shared goals and objectives? Uh, why do we need to have shared information uh, across the board, uh, which allows us access to patient records and patient data, so that you know appropriate care could be provided, duplication of information is avoided, and it also uh, leads to less of time wasted because of shared uh, information across uh, through patient records. And then we need to be looking at the culture of you know, collaboration. We need to be looking at the background in terms of the culture and obviously a shared decision making process. So some of these factors that I'm talking about are very important uh, in terms of understanding uh, uh, in, in terms of you know, building our understanding to the skills which are required to be able to, you know, uh, essentially lead or build a multidisciplinary team. So when we talk about this particular aspect, if I go back to the presentation, um, it is quite clear that when we talk about this, we we are looking at, uh, you know, the examples of uh, the team coming together, people coming, the team coming together, having these shared skills to be able to provide integrated care. Now. Because we're talking about skills and we are talking about team roles, what we also need to understand is theoretically from our point of view, also understand what do we mean by, uh, you know, the team roles. So when we talk about team roles, um, you know, specifically what I'm going to be looking at is uh, Dr. Belbin's, uh, you know, model of team roles that he came up with. Now, he is a scientist which is quite renowned in the sense that um, he's the one who basically came up with this particular um, you know, um, uh, theory when he did his research uh, to understand that when people uh, are asked to work in teams, they can be grouped together uh, in, in specific roles on the basis of three uh, broad, uh, you know, categories. So we generally see people when they are brought across into teams, they generally tend to be having three different qualities. So we will look at people being brought into the teams which are uh, going to exhibit um, or, or you know be a part of the team wherein they would either be thinkers they would either be doers which is action and in some cases we also look at people who are going to be you know um, uh, essentially social that means they will get on with any bit of work which has been given and uh, they will play their part in terms of, uh, you know, working within the team to be able to deliver that objective. So when we talk about these roles, he came across and he classified these roles into three different types. And these three different types were, uh, you know, action oriented, thought oriented and people oriented. So um, could also be said that they were thinkers, doers, and, uh, you know, essentially people who would get on with others other people from a point of view of you know different kind of uh, uh, roles that can be given to them uh, within the team so if i look at uh, you know broadly classifying and talking about them there's a handout which i'm going to share with you uh, which will be through the boodle and it talks about the roles um, and the background with which you know he came across uh, and he basically specifically studied the personality types of individuals during the experimentation that he did. He came up with these models and then he looked at uh, the common elements which could be classified together and then color coded. And this color coding, you know, essentially came across in these three different types of roles that we get to see. Uh, and he defined each of the role uh, in a bit more detail to talk about uh, the three types um, when we talk about action oriented. So when I say he came up with three different types of roles within people who are classified as action-oriented, as implementers, shapers, and complete finishers. 
and he then described some of the personality types you know within these roles um, to you know to give us some idea and indication in terms of if we have a person who is classified as uh, you know an implementer then in those cases these people tend to be more systematic they, they will apply common sense they are loyal they are structured and you know obviously some of the characteristics which were then governed out of the personality types that he studied and the models he studied are relevant to you know helping in the recognition of uh, uh, you know once the team is built what kind of role the person would end up taking within the team uh, and then perform accordingly uh, to be able to help the team achieve that particular goal now some of the questions which obviously got answered by this particular model that he's proposed and is now widely widely and globally accepted uh, he answered questions like what can be gained by identifying people's uh, you know role within the team so in order for him he came across and he clearly propagated the idea that in order for people to be effective they have to have uh, been given a clearly defined role which has both expectations and uh, you know understands and takes into account their uh, you know own uh, tendencies and preferences and this uh, allows you know uh, the uh, let's say the team leader to put them into and assign them uh, different roles now can the roles in the teams change yes the roles in the teams can change and the profiles uh, which are assigned to individuals within the team roles can definitely uh, change depending on the circumstances in the situation and certain people within certain roles over a point in time after gaining experience and uh, you know obviously uh, being a part of uh, the team and delivering that function or that role time and again uh, you know over the years can uh, develop that experience and then in those cases it is up to the team manager and the team uh, and, and the manager in particular to be able to move them into uh, a more appropriate role which is uh, which is going to be taking into account the skills attribute and the experience the person has has gained and a simple example of that could be as you gain experience within while working within the organization you move up your career ladder that means you get promotions and you get promoted you get higher responsibility and that is where we get to see the roles changing now one of the questions which came across in his research uh, because he was a psychologist and obviously he looked into the various personality tests and you know kind of uh, collated all the personality types uh, by studying the personality models in particular the meyer briggs uh, personality uh, you know model models that were proposed and he then came across uh, and you know one of the questions which was asked is what is an allowable weakness so do we have team members or people within the team always having uh, you know strengths and weaknesses would could there be members in the team which are primarily going to be weaker than some of the other members and could that mean that the overall goal could be jeopardized so in some cases you know in order to address that he basically came across with the term that yes team roles can have a, an allowable weakness which means at some stage you know there could be people working within the team and could be uh, you know uh, contributing to the achievement of the overall goal and objective but that would be commensurate to the amount of uh, pay they get for example or based on their performance and uh, you know the contribution to the overall objective they could be then classified and assigned roles uh, you know within the team and that would allow uh, allowable weakness or members within the team which come in and do their contribution and accordingly are uh, you know um, uh, compensated basis their performance there were some other questions which came across in his uh, discussions and while he proposed the model which was you know can a team role be sacrificed so he came across with a category of nine different roles as we get to see and they're classified across these three broader categories of action oriented thought oriented so one of the questions which came across was that can one of the roles within these categories be compromised or sacrificed essentially so in certain circumstances you generally get to see that you form a team and people will uh, you know take up a role of a coordinator somebody who's a shaper somebody who's a planter uh, somebody who can do evaluation can do critical thinking somebody who's a doer uh, you could look at you know somebody who's doing researching uh, and they could be good at communication coordination some of them work just in the role and are supportive of it and can work as a team worker 
some of them are more in uh, paying attention to completion uh, uh, and you know the achievement of objective and in some cases you would have people who probably at the higher level would be a specialist because they are highly focused they have knowledge capability and they are driven by professional standards to ensure that whatever is being given out as an objective is achieved to these standards so in the case of health and social care sector the cqc standard or the registered manager within the the care home or the old age home is the person who's responsible for ensuring uh, you know and can be termed as a specialist is responsible for ensuring that all compliances and standards on the quality side are met so in this particular model of dr Bered, uh, meredith belvin that he came up with of team roles and descriptions he was able to cast uh, you know and uh, you know fulfill that there could be nine different types of roles in a particular team and individuals can be given these roles depending on their skills their strengths their background and experience and this uh, uh, you know important step of recognizing their ability uh, in, in by assigning them this particular role was quite important because this would then allow the team to be able to achieve the overall objective so for this, in order to make sure that you are able, uh, you know, we, we are able to understand this in a bit more detail, what I uh, would also do at some stage is share this particular, uh, you know, handout, which will be up on Moodle. And this particular handout, uh, you know, essentially would be uh, the Dr. Meredith Belbin's, you know, team roles. And this handout will explain in a bit more detail, uh, you know, why it is important uh, for us to analyze the skills and then build the teams accordingly, which are motivated to be able to provide integrated care, uh, you know, as far as uh, the health and social care sector or in, you know, this multidisciplinary team approach is, is concerned. Now, let's quickly go across to the third assessment criteria, which is talking about, uh, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the bit in terms of EBA, explaining how multidisciplinary teams can be led. Uh, to deliver an integrated delivery uh, as far as uh, you know the um, you know the care is concerned so let me switch you back to this slide um, and this is where we will look at this um, so when we look at you know in the first instance we've understood uh, why and what skills are important um, and what could be the strengths and weaknesses of the multidisciplinary teams in the second outcome and the assessment criteria we've talked about uh, you know skills which are required to build these teams and to keep them motivated and in the last one what we want to understand is how do we lead these teams if you are in that position wherein you have to have uh, provide leadership then how do you go about providing leadership in a way wherein the MDT can be effectively used to deliver integrated uh, service uh, to patient or patient care in this case uh, you know uh, specifically uh, within the uh, health and social care sector or within the NHS. So a lot of uh, studies, you know, have been done on leadership and uh, leadership is a very, very, uh, you know, um, let's say you know, a topic which gets discussed very often. And, you know, there is no particular benchmark or a parameter to say that leadership, this kind of leadership is effective. There are, I think, 21 different models of leadership we talk about participative leadership laissez fair autocratic democratic we talk about situational leadership transformational leadership uh, uh, transactional leadership there are lots of different models which have uh, been proposed over the years but there's not one particular model which can uh, you know uh, answer this particular question of uh, you know how and what could be the most effective a leadership model to look at integrated service delivery within this uh, within the health and social care sector so it's a very controversial area uh, in terms of research in the area of social sciences but let's put it into a bit of perspective from because we are we are studying it from a perspective of mdt multidisciplinary teams and if you are in charge of a mdt how would you lead that team to ensure that the team is able to look at uh, you know delivering on the objectives which are set by the management so some of the objectives could be objectives responsible for making sure that uh, the patient care is delivered to the standards and these standards are then in turn set by cqc which is the main body uh, you know looking at maintaining standards and defining standards in this sector now when we talk about the integrated care there are certain elements to how this care is delivered and who receives it and what role they play so it is depicted on this particular 
uh, you know, diagram or a flow chart. So when we look at integrated care, you have a provider, you have a policymaker, in this case it is CQC, or a regulator, which is CQC. The policymaker could be the government, in this case, which is the National Health uh, Department. Uh, you look at provider, which could be hospitals, GPs, surgeries, uh, or, you know, people essentially working within this sector who are uh, working with the providers, uh, PCCT trusts, you know, GP surgeries, community centers and others who are delivering this, uh, you know, from where the delivery of care happens. Then you have care professionals or people or professionals working within the sector. There are evaluators, uh, you know, committees. Sometimes we see trusts, we see which are set up, which basically look at doing research and compiling data uh, feedback. Uh, and surveys which are done and compile them to look at uh, benchmarking it against the standards and they would be termed as evaluators. So the King's Fund and uh, you know the organizations which basically look at evaluating the service level uh, the, you know um, agreements and obviously how delivery is done. You look at the wider community which participates in the delivery of care. You have the service user and carers essentially people who are effectively at the front line delivering the care and you know in some cases here you would have providers who provide put out information uh, you know in in terms of how care can be delivered and then people who are managing these standards or basically looking at coordination sometimes we call them as practice managers within surgeries we we can name them as or call them as management within the pccg trust and they would be you know all a part and parcel of how integrated care is delivered to patients now when we talk about leading an mdt or a multidisciplinary team. This process is not very different from the PDCA cycle that we've studied in management, which talks about plan, do, study, and act. And when we talk about uh, the MDT process and the leadership which is required to be delivered across multidisciplinary teams, you generally see uh, in, 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 in our sector, we basically talk about preparing, assessing, diagnosing, planning, treating, and evaluating in order to make sure that uh, the leadership is effective. So when we talk about leadership within the NHS and the health and social care sector in general, what you generally get to see is that the people who are in that position would be looking at preparing their teams, would be looking at assessing their uh, performance. At some stage, they'll be looking at diagnosing problems or problems which arise during the course of working. They would plan ahead and uh, you know if there are bits and pieces that need to be changed tinkered with or you know essentially adapted they would look at them treating them by looking at corrective action plans or caps as we call them and then towards the end uh, once the goals and objectives are you know agreed and uh, you know achieved they will do a thorough evaluation to ensure that you know this uh, it becomes a process and if some of these similar situations are faced in the uh, in the future then there is a structured approach which is adapted and applied in improving these clinical uh, areas or you know clinical processes so that uh, you know the integrated care could be provided to the patients now there is an article that i would ask you to read rather than me go through it through the powerpoint and this would explain this six uh, six step uh, you know approach or the six phases approach as we call it so if i just maybe quickly you know bullet them uh, so that this is the six phase approach that we are talking about and this article which basically you know talks about this cyclical process of how continuous improvement is put in place in order to ensure that integrated service delivery happens within the nhs and the healthcare sector in general within the uk uh, is very uh, nicely depicted uh, you know in this particular article so what I would suggest is to go through this particular article, which I'm going to show you in a second, and the six phases that we need to look at can, uh, you know, I would encourage you to go through this in order to, uh, you know, build your understanding uh, on this. And this article is something that they will also be put up on Moodle. So I've taken the diagram from this particular article and it says, you know, multidisciplinary team working. And then obviously it's a case study which has been done in uh, one of the productive community hospitals of NHS, but it very clearly defines and describes how to lead and uh, lead a, a MDT, which is able to basically deliver on the objectives of integrated service or patient care uh, to patients which are receiving care at the hospital. So this six, step, uh, six phase process is actually explained in this document quite nicely. And I would suggest that you go through this in a bit more detail 
which will allow you to uh, complete this particular assessment criteria 2.3. So I hope uh, in today's session has been useful and uh, a copy of this recording uh, along with the presentation is going to be made available on Moodle shortly. And if you have any questions or queries, uh, I would be more than happy to take uh, take them on and um, you know obviously uh, look at some of the references that I put in and there are some good articles that you can go to uh, for uh, getting a bit more information with regards to the second learning outcome which is building and leading MDTs to achieve integrated care and service delivery. I'll catch up with you in the next session uh, which is going to be next week Monday same time and until then thank you and take care. Bye for now.